Thank you very much. The title of my talk is The Role of Cultural Diplomacy in Promoting Peace and Stability in Afghanistan. Since we are at the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy, I think it's appropriate that we should also discuss the soft power, the question that was just asked. So in that sense, uh, it is a response to that question. Let me start with the new strategy of US and NATO. As Mr. Murphy pointed out, the new strategy was announced by President Obama in, on 1st December at West Point, New York, uh, as after uh, almost a year of thinking. And this has three components, as you heard. A military strategy that will break the Taliban momentum through the deployment of 30,000 additional NATO trips, taking the total number to almost 150,000, and through increased capacity of Afghan forces <coughs> over the next 18 months. A more effective civilian strategy so that the government can take advantage of improved security situation and open the door to those Taliban who abandon violence and respect the human rights of fellow citizens. And third, a clear recognition that success in Afghanistan is linked to the U.S. partnership with Pakistan. In the past six months or so, since this new strategy was announced, there has been some progress on the military strategy because half the 30,000 troops have already arrived there, but very nominal progress on the civilian strategy. The number of Afghan uh, children attending schools has gone up from 1 million to, in 2001 to almost 7 million, as you heard, including one-third girl students. But these facilities are largely concentrated in urban areas, and the overall literacy percentage in Afghanistan is still very low, somewhere between 20 and 25 percent. The strength of and girls, of course, is one-third of that. The strength of the Afghan army has also increased from 2,000 to 100,000, but it has a weak ethnic balance with a much smaller proportion of Pashtuns who are 50% of the Afghan population. Overall, it's sad to report that insurgency in Afghanistan has been spreading in 27 out of 34 provinces. So insurgency has not been controlled, it is in fact expanding. The political strategy of reintegrating the Taliban is still evolving. Only very recently, President Obama has spelled out three specific preconditions for engaging the Taliban, cut off links to Al-Qaeda, stop fighting against the government, and accept the Afghan constitution, including its provision regarding human and women rights. It is difficult to predict if three Taliban group leaders who hold real power in Afghanistan would accept these preconditions. As Minister Jalali said this morning, this afternoon, uh, it is unlikely that those who wield real power, all they have to do is to wait for another 18 months or so and then try to take control. So why would they negotiate on this basis? The basic theme of my paper is that the proposed civilian strategy in Afghanistan cannot be effectively implemented only through governmental channels and especially through a central government that lacks credibility and virtually no capacity for governance. The rate of the central government, as you heard, is limited to Kabul and a few urban centers. In large part of the country, provincial and district governments are either non-existent or extremely weak. The rest are overwhelmed by security, ethnic, economic, and social problems. The civil society in Afghanistan is therefore a major role in promoting peace and stability in their country in the coming years. Let me make another quotation from the former British Foreign Secretary David Miliband who in a recent article published in the New York Review of Books says, a political settlement for Afghanistan has two dimensions. First, a new external settlement that commits Afghanistan neighbor to respect its sovereign integrity and that carries enough force and support to ensure that they abide by that commitment. And second, uh, a new and more inclusive internal political arrangement in, in which enough Afghan citizens have a stake and the central government has enough power and legitimacy to protect the country from threats from within and without. Now, if you take the first one, the external settlement with Afghan neighbor, this subject has been mentioned, and in fact, Ambassador Jalali indirectly referred to it more than once, provided the neighbors cooperate, and I think we just heard another uh, comment on the same thing. I think uh, the important thing is, as uh, Senior Rajiv just emphasized, that if you pursue the strategy only, only as an Afghan-centric strategy, it is not going to work. Pakistan's security is equally, if not more important, and the threat to Pakistan's security is a daily occurrence because the 
American invasion uh, uh, and the NATO invasion of Afghanistan in October 2001 pushed out large number of Taliban into the Pakistan tribal area who wanted to capture part of that territory. They first came to seek refuge, but they soon realized since they have lost Afghanistan, they need another piece of territory to establish their hold and then spread from there. And obviously, the Pakistan tribal area is a very unruled and uh, rugged country, so this looked. And then they thought, if we are here, why not spread a little bit to other areas in Pakistan to earn some extra income because that uh, tribal area is very rugged. So this becomes an existential threat to Pakistan that here is a group of people who want to capture a part of our territory and establish a, a new setup. So this is a very serious threat and internationally nobody seems to be taking it seriously. When in, uh, fortunately, uh, because they challenge our writ, they challenge the constitution, they challenge our parliament, they challenge our judiciary, these people who occupied Swat, for example, people suddenly realize what is all this? We were supporting all these people and now they are threatening our state. So in May this year, with full political support of all the political parties, the army moved into Swat and then into South Uzbekistan and demolished their infrastructure and externed uh, most of the people who were there. So, but in retaliation, there are enough people left. We have almost weekly uh, suicide attacks in different parts of bomb blast, and in the last one year, 4,000 innocent people have been killed as a result of these bomb blasts. So, for our threat to our securities is a daily occurrence. In fact. Uh, our troop, more people have died in Pakistan than have died in Afghanistan, uh, uh, including our troops compared to NATO troops or uh, other troops. So in that sense, um, the threat to Pakistan's security should be taken more seriously. Secondly, if you look at the insurgency, it has four components. There is the so-called Al-Qaeda network, which has a global agenda. They are not mostly in Afghanistan, they are everywhere, but uh, there are some elements there. Then there are the Afghan Taliban who lost the, who were uh, sort of defeated at that time, but they, the remnants are there and they, they are pretending that they are foreign, fighting against foreign occupation. Since a lot of progress has taken place, nobody is taking them seriously, but they are the real threat, particularly in the south where they are, Pashtuns are a majority, uh, and so therefore they are trying to fight. Third is the Pakistani Taliban, some of them came, who were born to support them, and as I mentioned earlier, they, want, they have their own agenda of capturing some part of Pakistan to, to establish there. And fourth are large number of religious groups who support them in South Punjab and a few other places. Each one of them has their own agenda, but at the top they all sort of have common agenda of using the name of Islam to capture power and enforce their agenda through, to, uh, through actual power. Now, we can look after the third and the fourth. The Pakistani Taliban who are threatening us and uh, the organizations which support them, but first and second are not our responsibility. We cannot go across into border and operate against the Taliban. We should pre prevent our people, anybody going from here, and similarly Afghanistan and NATO should ensure that nobody cross into Pakistan from there. These 150,000 people were pushed into our territory and became a threat to us. So that's why I think it is important to understand uh, that uh, the the Pakistan's strategy and policy has to be looked at from our security perspective and not a limited agenda that since a few groups in North Uzbekistan are helping some Taliban there, we should act against them. It's a long process for us to take control of all the organizations in Pakistan who actually were set up by the United States to fight the Russians. I mean, uh, and they were armed and trained and funded by them. And now they have become a threat to us. So we, it takes time to penetrate them, to find out you can't attack them. They are not, uh, you can't, you know, cap, they are not like military forces in Afghanistan as, as the Taliban were, where you just destroy them. They are madrasas, they are doing a lot of social work, and you can't really ca capture them. You have to penetrate them through intelligence. You have to uh, do something, you know, to, to defang them, so to say. It takes time. So unless it's looked at from our point of view. So on this subject, uh, we are, uh, as already said, Pakistan is more interested in the stability and peace in Afghanistan than even the United States because without them we can't be secure. So from our point of view, peace and stability is as important. Now the first, other second question, uh, how to evolve a more poli inclusive political arrangement in which enough Afghan citizens have a stake? That, this is the David Milliband's second point. In my view, apart from broadening the political framework to correct the ethnic imbalance as emphasized by the Bonn Agreement of 2002, they asked for a broad-based, multi-ethnic 
uh, and that has not happened just because the Northern Alliance walked in front of the American troops when they entered Kabul. They have had a dominant role and they have deliberately excluded but effective Pathan participation and that is one of the reasons why Taliban have more support uh, in the South and the East than, uh, than uh, elsewhere. So uh, the answer to this question is, lies in a self-sustaining process to encourage the civil society in Afghanistan to organize itself at the local, district, and provincial level. And the main objective of this process over the medium run would include the following. Bring about a gradual cultural and social transformation of Afghanistan by affording an opportunity to ordinary citizens to participate in social, cultural, and sports activities through local community organizations or clubs and recover from the trauma of three decades of war. Two, to bring the ethnic divide in Afghanistan by promoting interprovincial cultural and sporting activities, competitions, and tournaments, and rebuild the common Afghan cultural heritage of music, poetry, art, and handicrafts. Third, to build a strong network of civil society and community organizations that can gradually promote tolerance, peaceful coexistence, and inclusive development. In due course of time, this network can become a bulwark against extremism, criminal warlords and drug barons, and that eventually, if it's allowed to grow, can become the centerpiece of the civilian strategy once such a network has been created. To expect foreign powers or groups to come and encourage if the Taliban are capturing power, they need local civil society and community to counter that, to say this is not acceptable and this is acceptable. Uh, I think we all remember that the traumatized population of Afghanistan has undergone physical genocide under the Russian occupation, but they, that was followed by cultural genocide under the Taliban. Uh, the ta Taliban, while emphasizing religion, banned the playing of music and songs and photographs, TV and tape recorders and games. In fact, the Pakistan football team from Quetta, when they went there to play football, their heads were shaved because they were wearing what they call an Islamic dress, which was, you know, shots and they had, their heads were shaved out and they were sent back. I mean, this was the extent of primitiveness uh, of their. Uh, the medie this medieval behavior with the Buddhas in Bamiyan and immense treasures of Kabul Museum made them notorious throughout the world. Uh, therefore, education of girls, as you all heard, was virtually banned and women denied the opportunity to work and go outside their home. This is the background in which this cultural revival has to take place. because, And that is why people have welcomed what is happening today, because they have at least some opportunity to, play, uh, to participate in cultural activity, although on a very limited scale, only in the main cities, it is not yet spread. Some initiatives have been taken. In 2003, for example, a foundation for cultural and civil society was established in Afghanistan with limited financial support, about $2.5 million, from EEC and the UN Habitat. According to a survey completed in 2006, there are now 1,120 civil society organizations in 33 provinces of Afghanistan uh, in seven different areas, education and media, health and sports, legal affairs, economy, culture and art, environment, and cultural preservation. In 2006, 35% of the budgeted amount was spent on cultural activities, 35% on service delivery, but 81% of this amount was spent only in the Kabul area, only 19% in the other provinces. There are other organizations, one is called RAWA, it's an old organization uh, called the Revolutionary Association of Women of Afghanistan. It was actually set up in 77 to protect women's rights, but then it closed up. It has now been revived and is a very useful platform uh, to deal with women issues and uh, cultural participation. In my view, a comprehensive cultural diplomacy over the medium run should include the following. And these are my proposals for this uh, symposium. A quantum jump in organizing new civil society organizations and expanding the program of existing one. This can be achieved with financial assistance for organizations like these Foundation for Cultural Activities, RAWA, and other from the UN, EC, and other multilateral donors is increased substantially. As I've explained later, because of the sensitivity, I'm emphasizing multilateral assistance and not bilateral assistance, because it should not look like somebody imposing their own cultural design uh, on Afghanistan. Two, all government departments and organizations concerned with art, architecture, music, cinema, should be provided adequate funds to organize events that will attract professional artists, citizens, youth in these activities. For example, very recently, uh, the department organized a music competition for the whole of Afghanistan, 
Uzbeks, Tajiks, Pashtuns, and others. And for three months, it attracted so much attention on television, they were all interested who is going to win. I mean, this the kind of cultural activity that is multi-ethnic and, 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 and multi-provincial. A major focus of uh, this cultural campaign should be on sports. Uh, uh, for example, uh, we should build a football stadium in every major city of Afghanistan because football is a very popular sport. And if you are sporting activities in which all the provincial teams come together, that itself will promote uh, harmony and inter-ethnic. Uh, inter uh, for example, there should be Afghan participation should be participated in all the sporting activities, particularly uh, in uh, India and Pakistan, which are uh, quite recent. Uh, as you must have seen, uh, the debut of the Afghan team in the ICC T20 cricket in the West Indies, uh, in which they won one match against Ireland, created tremendous excitement to the whole city, whole country, that our cricket team can do so well. So this gives a sense of pride and sense of participation. So we should facilitate through the sport ministry as much participation of Afghan sporting team elsewhere. A program of scholarships under which as any number of Afghan students can be sent to neighboring countries, India and Pakistan, to study not only science and engineering, but art, architecture, literature, media, communication, and information technology, so that they uh, go back and participate in their own. Substantial support for print and electronic media in Afghanistan to modernize printing, broadcast, and telecasting facilities in the country along with adequate training. In implementing these and other facets of cultural diplomacy, it's important to be mindful of the political and cultural sensitivities of Afghanistan. The responsibility for initiating and coordinating these activities should be squarely with the civil society organization of Afghanistan, and the temptation to focus on short-term political or factional objectives should be curbed both by the government and the donor agency. The pre prevailing security situation may not be conducive for cultural activities in some part of the country. But local initiatives, which are of interest to the public at large, somehow manage to develop their own support mechanism. And they fight those who try to interrupt those. And there are, have been examples where the communities are lashkars have said uh, nothing doing. Finally, I would say, as emphasized this morning uh, uh, in several lectures, Afghanistan is not, a, uh, is not only very difficult to govern, but also to understand. And in the 20th century, the great game played by different foreign powers brought misery to the people. But more importantly, it created ethnic divides. This ethnic divide that we see has been accentuated by the machination of foreign powers. And uh, this upheaval has now created these seasons. I think it is important that a deliberate attempt is now made in Afghanistan to, future, to focus on the future rather than the past. In this, I think they should learn a very good lesson from German experience. After the Second World War, the Germans, deliberate, as a matter of deliberate policy, decided to forget the bitterness and the cleavage of the past and focus only on the future in their education system and in the media. The positive results of this wise policy are clearly visible today uh, here. And therefore, this, this policy of forgiveness and tolerance is also in line with the basic teaching of Islam. So this requires a deliberate policy effort to say that everything has happened, it is because of others. Please forget the past and uh, look into the future. Another important lesson of history to remember in this decentralized is the decentralized nature of Afghan governing structure. Before the Soviet invasion, Afghanistan was a loosely administered state with considerable autonomy for provinces under their respective power structures and tribal tradition. During the Taliban rule, with the help of arms provided by the US, etc., they tried to subordinate the tribal jirga system to Sharia law in the name of Islam. That was not very popular. The Pashtun tribe saw this as an attempt to take away their autonomy and tribal court. So therefore, in planning for a post-US or post-NATO era in Afghanistan, this lesson should never be forgotten. There will no doubt be need for an acceptable unifying leader or political party which can secure the willing participation of all ethnic groups to share power in this, on the basis of a decentralized system of government based on ethnic identity and tribal system in such a devolved system as it takes shapes. If you identify leaders who are also religious leaders, they can play a significant role in promoting a new social order. We're not looking for secular mullahs, you know, who, would, who are non-religious people, but people who have tribal controls going back to what Soviet Union destroyed uh, to achieve this. And a vibrant civil society and community organization, as I've described earlier, can play a very significant role 
in forging a consensus and promoting peace and stability in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for a very thought-provoking lecture. I'd be happy to take questions now from the audience. Okay, let's go to the back this time. My name is Valentine. I'm from Nigeria. My question is, uh, the Pakistani government knew that uh, America will eventually uh, evade Afghanistan and they let loose their borders to allow these insurgents to flow in. And the consequence is what uh, Pakistan is suffering today. So my question is, why did Pakistan make, uh, make such a mistake by allowing these guys to come in without protecting their borders when America invaded Afghanistan? Uh, the second question is, uh, the tribal regions of Pakistan is uh, it's very loose. The federal power is not reaching to the nooks and crannies of this uh, tribal region. Why is the uh, Pakistani government allowing this to happen? Because by doing so, they are not effectively controlling this uh, segment of the Pakistan. It's like an autonomous region or a country within a country. Thank you. Thank you. you see, the first question is, of course, uh, the post uh, U.S. withdrawal area and what Taliban will do. Let's not forget, as I briefly mentioned in my remarks in the morning, the Taliban were the people who were encouraged to fight the Soviet Union and they were actually uh, the creation of uh, uh, the U.S. and Pakistan together. Now, and after 94 when they came, they did bring peace to Afghanistan and this time many of the people. They controlled drug very successfully, but their governance was primitive. But until the attack in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam in August 1998, they were an acceptable alternative because they were spreading, they had captured almost 90% of Afghanistan. After that, uh, they, the, the West turned against them and we also gra gradually changed our policy against them. And as mentioned earlier, all Pathans are not Taliban and all Taliban are not Al-Qaeda. They did make the mistake of harboring Osama bin Laden and that brought so much misery to them. But they are, uh, many of them are, uh, as I think also mentioned in the morning, they provide rough, rough and ready just, justice. Unlike the Afghan rulers and civil servants, they are not corrupt. And uh, their attitude and their uh, things are very primitive, but they do provide an alternative. Uh, but let's hope that there will be people among them who will be more moderate and they have learned lessons and they probably, if America had not attacked Afghanistan in October 90, they would have transformed gradually. They were already changing because when you rule, you have to solve people's problem. The remaining 10% they had captured in five years, they would be in a very different position. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. And now they have charged with another ideological fervor, uh, which is given them new strength. Uh, let, our hope is, along with, uh, I think, ISAF and other forces, that there will be enough moderate Taliban, as they call them, who would join the coalition, and therefore the extremist Taliban would not come to power. But it is anybody's guess, because if this kind of a movement spreads, uh, then obviously nobody knows what, how to control them. That is one reason why uh, we cannot make them our enemies at this stage. Supposing tomorrow USA leaves and they capture Afghanistan, they'll say, okay, now Taliban are going to capture part of you and we'll help them because we sided with our enemies, our occupiers. So we, we, that's why I said al earlier that we can tackle three and four, not one and two. Uh, uh, the Afghan Taliban are the responsibility of the Afghans as well as NATO. Uh, uh, not uh, not Pakistan, uh, because in any case we don't have the capacity to operate across the border, but we can certainly ensure that nobody goes from here, as long as they can, US can ensure uh, and NATO can ensure that nobody comes uh, comes here. The other point about uh, tribal area, uh, the British, as you know, uh, never integrated tribal area. They left it as a buffer between Afghanistan and Pakistan, and uh, it's the first time that we have sent troops there. 120,000 of them. And as I mentioned earlier, we lost more troops than ISAF has lost in, in, in Afghanistan. 
because it's an area that you could not integrate totally. Some attempts were made there. They sent representative to parliament, initially elected by Maliks, now they're elected openly. And uh, some thought has been given to allow political parties to operate. But unfortunately, at this particular point of time, the atmosphere for this kind of activity is not ripe. For example, there is a political party called Awami National Party, which is an authentic Pathan party in NWFP. They have the government right now there. Yeah. The Taliban are targeting all their leaders. All of them, major leaders, have, been, have suffered two, three, four uh, uh, suicide attacks. Some have been killed, some have survived, because th they are the alternative to the Taliban. If they establish political activity. So we don't want them to become other targets. And uh, once their infrastructure is broken, and the tribal areas from within leadership within the tribal areas, even elders and people who provided leadership in the past of those tribes are the target of the Taliban. They don't want any alternative power structure to emerge. So I hope that as this uh, military operation goes on, and also we have to re-establish the civilian uh, administrative system, which was very effective during the British rule. A political agent or a deputy commissioner would handle that area. And that has been weakened, and efforts are being made to, 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 to go back. But uh, unlike Afghanistan, uh, their pockets of support within the tribal area is very limited. Uh, they are there, and so as soon as their infrastructure is broken, and we have penetrated the other organization in the rest of Pakistan, I hope we'll be able to control the situation. But as I said earlier, unless there are peace and stability to Afghanistan, our tribal area and the rest of Pakistan will continue to be affected because that insurgency and that uh, instability will spill over into our part of Pakistan. Another question? No? Yes? Okay. Okay. Sure. To the left here. Yeah. Could you just briefly articulate? You said you were promoting uh, scholarships. Yeah, just for uh, outside of the country for, for educational purposes uh, during your speech. But we've talked a lot here, um, not this conference particularly, but about the brain drain. So. If you're promoting scholarships and sending young people out to be educated, what incentive can you offer them to come back if their security is not, um, if, yeah, if their security is not necessarily um, guaranteed? Well, security is not guaranteed almost in any country, but I think by and large, if you educate, uh, I think uh, UN or uh, somebody should do some kind of uh, survey in this. I think Afghans who have gone on scholarships abroad, a good part of them do stay back if you offer them jobs in the UN, World Bank, a number of other projects. And uh, some of them also have a commitment to serve their communities. And that's why I mentioned if you send them to Europe or America, uh, they are not likely to come back. But if you send them to neighboring countries where the living conditions are almost similar, they are likely to come back. In my university, we have at least uh, uh, four or five Afghans who are studying, and studying art. And they are very talented, and, and they want to go back and, and uh, set up art shops, for example, to sell people who, who have art uh, to sell them. And we are encouraging them uh, to, to, to do that. So I think uh, that's why I mentioned that if you become engineers, they'll do one thing, but if they study art and literature and music, there are uh, opportunities, employment, private sector employment opportunities. For example, television stations can come in which you need uh, trained manpower. And th this gives them, when they go outside, they'll drive taxis uh, or do some manual job. Whereas if they go back to Afghanistan, the opportunities are much greater. So, and that's why if there's a network of organization, many of these civil society organizations will need trained manpower. So I think it's a process, may take five years, 10 years. That's why I use the word in the medium term, these are the objectives. It's not going to achieve dramatic results in one or two years, but the process must start now of cultural diplomacy to give us results in five or 10 years. Thank you. Your Excellency, Dr. Aziz, we extend your gratitude for your